words today. I love love brother and sister Wilson, and uh, uh, I believe he has something to share share with us that God shared with him. And I want to welcome him to the pulpit at this time. God bless you. Say praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. <clears throat> Giving honor to the. Spirit of the Lord that is here today. Come on and clap your hands and give God some praise. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Giving honor to Pastor and Sister Scott, the ministers of this church, to our elders, brother and sister Penrod, the Hicks, and to everyone in their prospective places. I'm especially thankful today that my wife is here and my two of my beautiful children the other one is at school doing finals so she's not here uh, but we give honor to them also and if you will just for a, a brief moment I want to talk a little bit about the Christmas that almost wasn't uh, my message today is taken from a very familiar passage of scripture found in Matthew chapter 2 You've heard the Christmas stories like A Christmas Carol that tells the story of a bitter old miser by the name of Ebenezer Scrooge. You've heard stories of the Grinch who stole Christmas. And these are make-believe, and we thank God they make-believe. However, today we're going to take a look at a man who hated Christmas. The story takes place in Matthew 2. Not only is he not make-believe, he was a man who is known throughout history as being one of the most notorious haters of Christmas. The Bible reads in Matthew chapter 2 beginning at verse 1, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests, the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where this Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least among the princes of Judea? For out of thee shall come a governor, and they, thou, shall rule my people Israel. Verse 7 says, And when Herod had privately, privately, in other words, he called them together privately, and inquired of them diligently what time this star had appeared. Verse 8 says that, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring him Bring me word again that I may come and I may worship him also. Verse 9 says, And when they heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word, O oh God. It's already blessed now. Bless us. Use me, God, as a ready pen to speak your word under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Use my tongue, O oh God. Use my mind. Filter my thoughts with your thoughts, O oh God. Bless us not only to be hearers of the word, but do as we ask this now in Jesus' name and for his glory. Come on and clap your hands and give God some praise one more time. And you may take your seat in the presence of the Lord. So in Matthew chapter 1, 
we saw the nativity scene up here being played out. We saw where the announcement of the birth of Christ came. And the wise men, the Parisian magi came and inquired in Jerusalem in where exactly would this baby child be born because they wanted to come and worship him. They came with such an entourage that even the king, Herod, had to hear about it because there was so much talk of this child and these men, this entourage that had came to worship him. And Herod, being who he was, that is, the king of the Jews, the Bible says this troubled him. And he wanted to know exactly where this child was being born. The Bible says that he sent the Magi to go and to look. And when they found out exactly where this child was to be born, that they were to come and tell him. So that he too could go and worship. The man who hated Christmas wanted to go and worship the baby child, Christ. Matthew Henry commentary states this. We must preach Jesus. However, we cannot always know who will hear the message of the gospel and how they will respond. I want you to know this morning, it's not only important that you hear the gospel. It's not only important that you hear this message this morning, but it is important how you respond to the message. A Christmas. Picture it with me, if you will. Let me transport you back. It's year 47 BC. Herod the Great is about 25 years old, according to Jewish tradition. Jose Josephus, Fabius Josephus, was a historian of the Jewish people. He accurately recorded the birth of Christ. He accurately recorded the Magi coming into the city and inquiring. This was not a religious man. So I want you to know that Jesus' birth is not only a mythical action, it is recorded in history. So even if you don't believe the Bible on the birth of Christ, it is written in history that Jesus was born. And he caused such a ruckus on the day that he was born. Hmm. The Romans had hoped that Herod would pacify the Jews they placed him in control and in position there, and they called him king of the Jew. Now, Herod was famous because he was a murderous king. His reign was noted. Look at this. His reign was noted for being the most ruthless leader of ancient Jewish history. He was married into a Jewish family. He attained the king, the title of the king of Jews during his governorship. But note, he was not a Jew. He was not even a Jew by religion. He was known for killing his brother-in-law, his mother-in-law, his wife, and two kids. This was a bad dude. He hated people who threatened his reign. He crawled all the way to the top, and anything that got in his way, he was all about taking it out. Josephus called him the barbaric one. Another writer dubbed him as the malevolent maniac. Another writer called him the great pervert. At the age of 70, he was dying. But still in charge, he received this vision, this visit, as you were, from these strange men, these magi who came into town and brought all of this, this ruckus with them, inquiring of this birth of this new king of the Jews. And you heard it. It troubled him because he was the king of the Jews. He fought and killed for that title. Now, who was this child to come and move in on his turf today? Praise God. If he killed his mother-in-law, his father well, you can... You know, mother-in-law's, father-in-law's a little disposable. 
I'm not going you know, I'm not. You know, you know, you know. But, but he killed his own wife. He killed his own two sons. Because he heard a rumor that they were trying to usurp his authority and take control and had him killed. This was a bad, Herod was a bad dude. Look at what the Bible says. When the visitors came to inquire, where is the one who had been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and become to worship him. Matthew 2 and 2. Herod didn't know either, but he knew he better find out what this was all about. They were looking for someone born king of the Jews. And how could this be? How could this be? Because I am the king of the Jews. The Bible says that he was disturbed. He was troubled in his spirit. The Greek word there for trouble means he was shaken violently to the core of his being. Imagine it. This man fought for this title. This man fought for control of this region of the world. It was, listen to me, he was 70, and now he could finally die in peace because he had wiped out all of his enemies. He was titled king of the Jews. He reigned and reigned with supreme authority during that time. And now all of a sudden, when he's getting ready to die at the ripe age of 70, here comes this announcement. These magi with their mirror and their frankincense, and their gifts. And we come to worship the king of the Jews, they said. This troubled Herod. The Bible says. Why? Because he has to do all of his enemies. And finally, he could die triumphantly. Herod knew that the Jews were looking for the Messiah, the one who would sin and save them and reign as king of his people. Isaiah 7 and 14. Listen to what it says. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin with a child will give birth to a son and we will call him Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Yeah. Isaiah 9 and 6 says this, for unto us is born, a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. Yeah. I'm not sure how serious Herod took this announcement. But when he called the chief priests and the scribes, the professional preachers to come and tell him where was this child born, he knew it was something to it. And just in case, if it wasn't, he still wanted to make sure it was taken out. The Bible says, in verse 4, when he called together the people, chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, they replied, for this is that that was written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least of the rulers of Judea. For out of you will come the ruler who will shepherd all of his people of Israel. Matthew 4 through six. Before I tell you what happened next, here's some facts to keep in mind. Herod was very old. He was sick and he was in pain. Many writers said that he, his body at this particular time, it actually convulsed. He had seizures, all painful seizures all the time. Somebody said that he was having some form of dementia coming and going because after he killed his wife, it had been at least 40 years, I think it was, after his wife was murdered. It bothered him. Still to this day, it drove him crazy. And verse 16 says this. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, were exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years of age and under, according to the time that he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Look at what he did. This man was a vicious killer. He hated 
Christmas. He sent out the word because he felt like the Magi, which if you read in Matthew chapter 2, the Lord appeared unto them an angel and told them, listen, they found the baby Jesus. They went and worshiped him, brought him gifts, just like the nativity scene showed. They went and found Joseph and Mary with the baby Jesus, and they brought him gifts, and they said, we come to bow down and worship him. And then as they were getting ready to go back home, you can read it right there. The Bible says in verse 17, 18, and 19 that the Magi had a visit from the angel of the Lord. And the angel told him, listen, don't don't go back to see King Herod. Uh -uh. Go this way. Go round about and take the back road to your home and go home. Because you know what Herod would have did to the Magi once they told him that where Christ was born? He would have killed them too. I'm, he, was, he, was a, he was the murder of Christmas. You talk about the Grinch. You talk about the Scrooge. This man was the embodiment of the man who wanted to destroy and never, ever know of a Christmas story. Whew, okay. Herod stands as a symbol today of the kind of world that Jesus came into. He represents the world's welcoming committee for the Son of God. It's not the way you thought it would be. See, Jesus was born the ruler of this world, but Herod wanted to kill him. John 1 and 1 1 1 says this, He came to what was his own, but his own received him not. Herod stands for the bloodthirsty, baby-killing, demoralized, cruel, vindictive world system where life, where human life is cheap. That's why we have terrorist attacks almost every day right down the street and right next door to you. That's why you can go and they advertise that the government helps pay for. They kill babies for a living in this world. There's another way you can look at Christmas. We have the magi, the wise men, who when they found the baby, bowed down and worshipped him. It's ironic twist that the Christmas story has these pagans coming to worship Jesus. Because the Bible says that Herod called the scribes and the chief priests of the people to come and tell him about this Christ. So it wasn't that they didn't know the Messiah was coming. They had the word of God. They had the signs to tell them that Jesus was to be born, that a star would come and shine, that this was the time that they should expect the birth of Christ. But what did they do? They gave the information to Herod. And did they go? Did they follow the Magi to worship him? These were people, these were religious people who knew the word of God. Talk about a twist to the Christmas story. You got pagans coming, looking for the baby Jesus. I don't know about you, but man, that makes me think. If pagans can come, if pagans can go the distance and search out Christ, that they may bow down and worship him, but we who have the word, we know the word, we've got to be primed up, picked up, pushed up, you got to be bought, borrowed, and borrowed to worship. It's, it's just the word of God. It's just the word of God. But the wise men proved themselves worthy of their name. When they found Jesus, they worshiped him gladly. Those... When you find Jesus, when you get to know the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, when you got the baptism of Jesus, when you have God living on the inside of you, you are a wise man. And you can worship God gladly. I'm getting ready. I want to ask you something today. How do you respond? 
if information alone could save you, then Herod would have been saved. But the Bible says he knew the truth, or at least suspected the truth. He knew that the baby boy was to be born, would save the people, and be their God, their king, their ruler. However, he still sought to destroy the child Jesus. You see, if you have information, information doesn't necessarily save you. You can know the truth. You know you need to be baptized. You know you need to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know you need to live right. You know you need to come to church. You know you need to do what's right. You can have the information, but still do nothing with it. The Bible says Herod had the information. The scribes had the information. But he sought to destroy Christmas. He sought to wipe out Christmas from the face of the earth. So just because you have information, it doesn't mean that it will save you. It's what you do with that information. <laughs> the, ma <laughs> Woo! the Magi had the information. Pagans had the information. But they knew what to do with it. The Bible says they came and they sought Jesus and said, I've come to bow down and worship him. For he shall be the king of his people, the Lord of lords, the king of kings, the great I am. Whew. I want to be a pagan today, praise God. I want to search out Jesus. I want to know him in the holiness of his word. I want to know him as my personal savior today. I want to get closer to him than I can ever be, praise God. Come on, come on. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. What are you going to do with this information today? Which king will you serve? Which kingdom will you align yourself with? Will it be King Herod, the murderer of Christmas? The one who tried to assassinate Christ by killing thousands and thousands of innocent babies. That particular time is still known in history as the slaughter of the innocent. The Bible says in 19 and 20, she tried to be comforted for her children were gone, but she could not be comforted. People lost their children at the hand of this evil, murderous Grinch who wanted to wipe Christmas from the earth. You have to make a choice today. The Bible says in Luke 16 and 13 that you cannot serve two masters. You have to love one and hate the other. Will you join hands with the one who tried to murder Christmas and still wants to do it today? Or will you come today and kneel down and worship and affirm your kinship with the Lord Jesus? I want to serve you a warning today in this season that we live in. Not to give in to the spirit of Herod. He knew that the announcement of this child was that of the king of the Jews, their savior, their deliverer. But listen to what he said. He said, come and tell me where this child is that I may go and worship him. He wasn't going to go and worship him. He was going to go and kill him is what he wanted to do. And you have to ask yourself, are you like Herod? Do you give the Lord lip service but your heart is far from it? He said he wanted to worship God, but we know what he wanted to do because he killed all them babies during that time. He wanted to kill baby Jesus. He wanted to destroy Christmas. He said it with his mouth, I want to worship him, but his heart was far from it. And I want to ask you today, will you stand with Herod? Or will you be like the Magi? Will you push everything to the side and go and find Jesus and worship him? Will you go and turn over your heart and your soul to he 
that came into this world to his own, but his own received him not, but plotted to kill him? Stand to your feet. We have to root out any and all influence of the spirit of Herod in our lives. You have to ask yourself, will I turn to this world and say one thing with my mouth and do another thing with my heart? Or will I align myself with Christ Jesus and do what the Bible says we ought to do in order to be saved? My question to you today is do you seek to bow down before him, honor him, and shower him with your worship? That's what the Christmas season is all about. Jesus is the greatest gift. I mean, you could give to anybody. He's the greatest gift that you can have. That's what, Santa Claus is not why we celebrate Christmas. I, I know this is a shocker for some. <laughs> but let me tell you, though, Santa Claus is not the reason why we celebrate Christmas. Jesus is the reason for the season. His birth, birth, his death, and his resurrection, that's why we celebrate Christmas. The gift of eternal life has come to you today. Praise God. Romans 12 and 1 says this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I like the Amplify. The Amplify says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourself set apart as a living sacrifice, holy, well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. If you believe that Jesus is God, clap your hands and give him some praise. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of this world, come down to this altar right now. Make your way. Push everything else to the side right now and come to this altar if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of this world. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the only one who can deliver you from a sin, sick world, he's the only one that can save your soul, I want you to open up your mouth and begin to talk to God right now. Just begin to open up your mouth and have a conversation with him. Tell him how much you love him right now. Tell God I love you right now, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I don't want to be like Herod. I don't want to give you lip service, God. But I want to come and worship you. I want to bow down before you, Jesus. If you believe that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, ask him to save you right now. Open up your mouth and tell him to do it all over again. Even if you've been saved before, open up your mouth and talk to him. And tell him, God, I want you to come into my heart all over again for this Christmas season, Jesus. I know that it's not about what I can do, but it's, what I, but it's about what you can do, Jesus. I can't save myself, God. I need you, Jesus. Come on, somebody. Tell him, I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. I need you more than I ever needed you before. I need you, Jesus. I need you. If you believe all of this, then do what those wise men did. They came and bowed down and worshipped Christ. Come on, lift up your hands and just begin to worship him. Come on, somebody, lift up your hands and begin to worship him. Come on, come on, come on, somebody, lift up your hands and just begin to worship him. Here we are, God. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. We adore you, Jesus. We give you praise, glory, and honor because you're worthy, God. You're worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to Jesus. Come on, somebody, worship him. Come on, just begin to talk to him. I know this is strange for some, but this is how God desires to save us today. This is what Christmas is all about. 
praise God. Come on, somebody, just begin to worship him. And where this road Come had on. taken him. Come on. Don't stop. Come on, don't stop. Cause never Come on. in a million Get into the Christmas spirit and just begin to talk to God. Would he have dreamed Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. And standing at the manger, he saw with his own eyes the message from the angels come to life. And Joseph said, why me? I'm just a simple man of trade. Why him with all the rulers in the world? Why here inside a stable filled with hay? Why her? She's just an ordinary girl. Now I'm not one to second guess what the angels had to say. But this is such a strange way to save our world. To think of how it could have been if Jesus had come as he deserved there would have been no Bethlehem no lowly shepherds at his birth but Joseph knew the reason love had to reach so far and as he held my Savior in his arms, he must have thought, why him? I'm just a simple man of trade. Why him with all the rulers in the world? Why here? Inside a stable filled with hay. Why her? She's just an ordinary girl. But I'm not one to second guess what the angels had to say. But this is such a strange way to save our world. a strange way but I'm not one to second guess what the angels had to say but this is such a strange way to save our world it's such a strange way to save our world. Thank you, Lord, for the strange way to save our world. I thank you for saving our world. Oh, thank you, Lord, for saving our See? 